30th anniversary of the release. But tell me how it came to pass that you're here in the UK. Well, you guys did this great reconstruction of the movie, this 4K reconstruction of the film, and you're putting it out in theaters, and the uh, musical is going to be playing, has been playing, and uh, it seems like there, there's there been a fair amount of 30th anniversary stuff going on in the States as well. But um, th it's great that the movie's coming into the theaters, even for a limited run. I'm very happy about that. Well, now you have a teenage daughter. What's she made of Heather's? Well, she just saw the movie for the first time uh, two weeks ago, and I think her initial reaction was, ooh, that's you, and looking back and forth and kind of being a little bit, since she didn't grow up with me being an actress, knew I had been an actress, but I don't, you know, I didn't talk about it all the time. Uh, so I think after, once she got past the, the, the point of going, oh, that's my mom, uh, then she was laughing at our hair and, uh, shoulder pads and thinking right. that was hilarious. And the most relatable part to her, at her, she's a younger teenager, was the high school cliques and the, the you know, archetype characters, because that, she said, that just still exists today. And that's really the thing that, that um, she related to. Is the perception of the movie the same here as it is in the US? Do people have the same reactions to it? As far as I can tell, the reactions are similar. The movie has a cult following, and it's had a cult following since it came out. Um, I've always felt that people from outside the United States must be looking at this movie with the eyes of, oh my God, is that really what high school is like for these people? And is it, why is it so important to American culture? Why do they have this obsession with high school? So I have to assume that for, for people in Britain, they must be looking at American high school with different eyes than those of us do in the States. Yes, Universal. Well, it's interesting what you say because one of the things about it translating over here, first of all, British people have amazing sense of humor. So they, you know, I, I think they, they probably got a lot of the movie, you know, originally in, in the way that it was intended. Um, and then also they've made a musical of Heather's and they had you know, uh, had it in New York and Los Angeles, but the audiences here in London have gone insane and they love it and they weren't sure it would translate, you know, very American, high, high school, all the different language. But at this stage, I think, you know, a lot of um, young children are raised on American TV for better or worse. In some ways, the popularity of the, of the John Hughes moves made it easier for us to make the film because uh, the company that financed Heather's was in the business of making sort of exploitation genre movies and most of what they would have done would be horror films or teen, teen exploitation films, that sort of thing. And by exploitation, I mean just playing out genre, genre elements. And so for Heather's, we thought, oh, well, we can sneak this in there and do something very different and do something which has a sort of a stronger, satirical, darker, humored point of view and get it in there because the company just wanted to make a, another teen movie that they could sell to the same audience that was seeing John Hughes movies. Um, so in a lot of ways, the, the popular teen films of the day helped us get this thing made. It basically came out, we had a big screening, and then um, it was open for a weekend or two, and then it kind of disappeared. And then I noticed, as you know, at about the 10 year mark, I got a call and said, oh, we're re-releasing it on a, um, a new, VHS, <laughs> and would you do a documentary? And so we all, they rolled us all in, and we were all like, we loved making the movie, oh yeah, 10 years on, it's actually more popular now, and then cut to 20 years, 25 years, and now at 30, so I would say at 30, it's definitely probably bigger than it's ever been, which is just fantastic and insane. The, Veronica's an interesting character because she is morally ambiguous and morally ambivalent. So she can hang with the cool kids, she can hang with the geeks, she, as, you, as you point out. She can relate to every single one of the people in that high school and could arguably say she was their friend. But at the same time, uh, she didn't feel good about her identifications with the people who were doing you know, e evil or morally suspect things. So she becomes then a very complicated character. And following her journey, we take her from the point where she's really an adjunct to the Heathers to a point where she's saying, we need to, we need to have um, inclusion in our high school life, you know, rather than exclude people, rather than bully people, we need to treat each other well. So it's a moral journey for her. And by creating this character who's so complex and conflicted, uh, 
and wh whom we like, we can identify with her and go through it and take her moral journey. And when you're making a movie that's as dark humored as this, that actually provides a good inroad for that. Yeah. But I think, in, uh, yes, there were definitely cliques among uh, us of, of, on the set because just by nature, in anything you do in life, that's the whole thing. There's Heathers, uh, you know, the Heathers can be anywhere in the workplace, in university, in, in um, it just in your local parish, you know, there's always the controlling people who are the most popular, who make the rules, and other people are too intimidated by them. So, Heathers are everywhere. <laughs> we wanted to push the limits as well as we could. As a director, I wanted to make sure that in the midst of all this sort of mirth over murder, that there was a point at which the characters realized that what they were doing had real consequences that they hadn't anticipated. So it was important to push the darkness as well as the lightness and to, and to come up with an uncomfortable balance for that. And that's how these kinds of movies, these good satirical dark comedies, if you can figure out how to make them, that's what you, you aim for, is being able to play those extremes in a way that's emotionally engaging mm -hmm. and, and makes you identify morally with the characters, but that's also ironic and funny. So you're finding yourself laughing at things that you know you shouldn't be laughing at. So Obviously, the 80s, there's no internet, social media, um, school shootings. <laughs> that was, you know, that, that wasn't happening at that time. So you, it, it is more innocent and relevant. It's not just about the cool hair and wardrobe, um, where oftentimes you do watch something and you think, oh, they just set that there because they wanted cool cars or, you know, having something and what is the relevance of that time. But um, we were in that time, so it wasn't set at a different time other than what we were in. But yes, it was a very different time than now. I think Dan, Dan Waters, who wrote the script, is, is brilliant. I mean, he, his voice and what he brought to this world is something that nobody else has been able to equal. So if nothing else, simply quality of writing, quality of nature of humor, the, the observation of character, all that sort of thing, people just haven't been able to find what Dan was able to do as a screenwriter. I really think that's the main difference. And also, it's always tricky when you, when you want to make satirical uh, movies and when you want to do dark comedy, it's a very small target to hit. So a lot of times people are afraid to even aim at that target, so they don't go there. And you get things that are just too safe, too insipid, don't, don't take it far enough. You, you have to have the courage to aim square at that target and hope you hit it in order to make the movie work. Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching Hey You Guys! Hey You Guys, huh? Hey you guys, Is that yeah. from the Goonies? Nice. Hey!